You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I, he's phoned me a couple of times. I was a fugitive in America. He's actually met Gotti. You know, he, he was... Gotti wanted him to do some work with him, but... I mean, he'd earn about a million a week. I took it down on one trip. I risked my life. What did you take down? It was on, a, on just a thing of the car. It was a, it was a bazooka and some Kalashnikovs. I guess, you know, you're flying here and then everywhere, but you're looking over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, and then you get caught and then you're doing 20 years. I got 14 years altogether. Mary Hindley, Rose West, came in. Uh, so I was walking across corridors, crossing them. I mean, I was in with the two IRA, Martina and Ella, the ones that bombed the Brighton bombing in 86. They were, because I was a double cate prisoner because of the mafia connection. How many has actually get sent to prison? Probably about over 200 of us. And I knew this guy was going to get killed and I knew his kids, I knew his wife. Boom, we're on. And today's <laughs> guest, we've got, what do they call you? The, 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 mafia, the princess. mafia princess. That's uh, the journalist did that. Mm -hmm. so do I you just, know what? It's pretty cool. Well, I took it on, on with my books. So yeah. Thought, yeah. And we'll plug the book straight away. The Mafia Princess. Look, Mad Reed, you sent me this book a week ago, read it, um, got you on the podcast. Look, you wrote it over 10 years ago. Fascinating story from taking over the family's business, prisons, drugs, that you got prison yourself. But mad story about the mafia and it's the proper mafia, it's the Italian mafia, it's not. Mm, it's the yeah. Andrangheta. Yeah, how do you pronounce that? Andrangheta. What does That's that mean? from uh, southern Italy. Andrina is basically like a family unit. Because mm -hmm. that's what they are, the mafia families, they're all families, they're all linked with blood. Um, so it's all members of mm -hmm. family. And outsiders obviously come in, but it's mainly family members yeah. that are involved, the clans. So you go through generations. My family's through generations of that. Mm -hmm. Before we get into all the nitty gritty, I always go back to the start of my guests to get a better understanding about them, mm -hmm. where you grew up, how it all began. Yeah, so basically I was born in Milan in 1970. Mm -hmm. My mother was is, was English. She's died, unfortunately, now. But So she went out in uh, the late 60s to Milan to be an au pair. Met my father in 1970. I came along and within a few months that she'd met him. And uh, I came along and she, then she started to realise she didn't know who my father was. Although he's always picking her up in different cars and that. I said, oh, my father's got a showroom. He didn't. He nicked every car every night, a different car <laughs> to pick her up. You know, that was the crazy life she was going into. And then uh, she had lots of brothers and sisters, siblings. There was 12 all together. Um, so uh, from then, she, I stayed. We stayed till I was nine. And then my mother realised that the family were getting more and more into serious crime. And she was apprehensive about it. So she thought, I want to go back to the UK. Mm -hmm. And she did in 1979. I didn't know a word of English till, till then. And then they just took, sent me to primary, learned till I was, you know, in, in high school, I was actually at the level of a child of that age mm -hmm. and spoke like a child. So it's amazing how mm -hmm. much children can learn. Um, so you say the f the the mafia was bloodline. Was did your dad have a big family family? Yeah. So they were already in the mafia. Yeah. So Great. my on my nonna's side, my nonna's my grandma, my my dad's mum. She was born into the clan of Seraino, which is from the toe of Italy, Reggio Calabria. So you can imagine it's a boot. The toe is Calabria, and um, so she was born into that. Uh, but she decided in the 60s to go and live up in Milan because there was more opportunities, criminal opportunities, because this is someone my nonna was, didn't know. And all she knew was a life of crime since she was born. You know, all the brothers were high up in the mafia. And then, of course, she created her own clan in the, in the, in the north 
so my father became quite important because he was the one that was in a, he was going out there bringing involving different countries with the drug business merchandise and so um so I guess my dad without my nan they couldn't they had to have each other. She was the logistical side of it. My dad was the one that was bringing in the business. Mm -hmm. So they became their own entity. And it was this, this family down south turned for help to us. To I'm saying us because at that time, that's when I ended up going back when I was 18. So from nine years old, I stayed here. And then I met my daughter's father, fell in love with him. He's one of the guys that used to work with my uncle. You could say one of the soldiers. And my father didn't speak to me for a year. He was he wanted me to be with a doctor or a lawyer. It's like, well, how can you be like that when you just, you know, this is where we're coming from. It's not... Um, but, but saying that, though, I lived another life. You know, I knew right from wrong and I knew... But I had a massive pull from my family because it was the big family unit... I love being there. It was the, you know, the the love and the loyalty and the affection and which I didn't have in the UK. I didn't have a big, my mother's side wasn't a big family and they certainly weren't as warm as the Italian side. So when I went over every year, that was a big mistake my mum made. She took me back every year. Mm -hmm. So from taking me from nine, she took me on my summer holidays. So I was treated like a princess. I was given everything and we go over with, one set of luggage would come back with three. Do you know what I mean? It was, and 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 that pull made me want to go back then. I met my daughter's father, so I thought, I want a, mm -hmm. a life there. And as soon as I, I was 18, I went to live in, in Milan. So it was an attraction for a very young age, just getting treated like a queen, just everybody loves you, you've got the respect. Did you know who you, when, when did you know who your family was? At 13. I was, I used to go over, as I said, every year. And my father actually in 79, when I came to the UK with my mum, he went on a run to America. He was a fugitive for killing someone, which turned out to be self-defense because this guy, if it wasn't him, it would have been vice versa. So um, he went on the run then in, in that time. And then by 13 in 1983, he was found uh, over traffic violation, <laughs> running a red light, and he got arrested and got found who he was. So he got extradited back to Italy to face a murder charge back then. Um, so I hadn't seen him since I was nine. So, of course, this, then he, in front of him, there's this teenage girl, and I was quite developed by 13, and I think it was a massive shock for him. I, he'd phoned me a couple of times while he was a fugitive in America. He's actually met Gotti, you know, he, he was, Gotti wanted him to do some work with him, but they sort of did, but my dad wouldn't sort of, and of course my dad is old school, he comes from the old family, so in America they can't be touched, if you know what I mean, they're not. Um, so yeah, there's there's so much I can go into with, with yeah, that. Yeah, we'll, we'll go down the um, hall, man, like, see when you're, did your dad try and protect you from going down that life by keeping you here, or... It was my mum. It protected me. My dad, he he was in that life and it was like, do you know what people say, don't you resent my your dad? And I guess in the way... Why do the people say that? Because he got me involved in everything I got involved in. But you, like you say, you know, you know the choices that you made. But I was made. really young. I was 18. Naive. Yeah. I was very... So this is my next thing I need to say. I had, it's only now, I'm a criminologist now. I, did my, I got my honours. I'm possibly going on to do an... A, a, PhD mm -hmm. doctorate, which is wow, you know, from that to that, mm -hmm. it's like so. But you've loved that life, so you understand yeah, it more. But at first, when I did it, it was through my own wanting to know. It's like a therapy, it's almost fair searching for your yeah. own answers. And I did mm -hmm. find quite a few answers. Is that for peace? It, yeah, it was so. Yeah, I think I finally now at my age, I'm 52, I am far more at peace. And I've ever been, I've had my head down in shame. I've, you know, I've tried to get away because I did what I did. And and then I've turned it around. And now I try and help with it. You know, I try and give something back. Uh, I've been into prison to talk. I do A-level students, university student talks about my experience as a criminal. You know, having uh, 
the life, living that life and in prison and, you know, women's prisons and, and that should probably go on then too. But, mm -hmm. um, so in doing that, I found that I had very much daddy issues going back to my father <laughs> because my father always wanted a boy to the point when I was eight years old in a restaurant with friends, he made me cry because he's talking about wanting this boy. Now, I don't remember that, but I think my subconscious does because I rem all I remember was at the time that I was getting involved in the family business is I'm going to show him that he doesn't need a boy <laughs> to do that. And I'm smiling here because it's ridiculous because now as a grown woman and as a mature woman, I think, what? <laughs> you know, why? I mean, the, the repercussions of it and the hurt and upset and what I caused my mom and my child. And <laughs> yeah, sorry. And, but of course, then when my child was born, that well, was a big slap in the face because I thought, oh my God, this is serious. What I got myself into. And of course, you've got to look back and you think with my dad, you know, yeah, I did make my choices. I was very naive and very, and I had a massive issue with him, a lot to prove to him that. Who did he have to trust? You know, when you've got vast amounts of money, I mainly dealt with the money. Um, well, I got done for money laundering. And he not, he, not many people you can trust in that life with them vast amounts of money to the point where we had a money machine. That's how much money was coming in. So, you know, I understood his, he didn't intentionally want me to break the law. But he did allow it, which, you know, if I look, my children, one's 31, one's 22, I'd never dream, I'd, take, I'd do the time for them. <laughs> you know, I would never dream of getting them involved in something like that. Um, yeah, that's a difficult thing, though, isn't it? Hindsight's always a wonderful thing, especially yeah. with these sort of stories. But so, 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 see, the mafia started in Sicily. Is it the same as the Americans at five families in Italy? Or how does it work? What's the difference between the mafia in Italy and the mafia in America? So you've got... So actually, the origins of Mafia, they say there's three Spanish knights came over from Spain. They were detained in a prison in one of the islands and they made up the clans. They came out and made up the Andrangheta in Calabria, Gamora in Naples and Cosa Nostra in Sicily. So there's three lots of mafias, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the origins, a lot of them that did go to America were the Sicilians to start with in the 1920s, 30s, and so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, but there's a lot of Calabrians that went over as well. So the the difference is the, you see, they say, the Americans say they don't involve the women, they don't involve, they protect them. In Italy, in in the Italian mafia, they the women are the backbone. And they only just, the authorities only just realised that 20 years ago. Because without the women, the men wouldn't be able to, because they were the ones that, well, like I said, it's the backbone, the logistical side of it. Like I said with my nan, you know, the, the, you know, behind every strong man, every a strong woman. powerful man, there's a mm -hmm. strong woman. Not, not all cases, of course, but so the women are very much involved. The logistical side, they're keeping everything together and making sure shipment gets in there where it's distributed. Um, so it's why was it, that? Is that because the women fly under the radar? The women are more yes. smart, are that no, the women they fly under the trusted. radar, they don't look at them. The police never used to look at us. We used to get raided at my nonna's house, and most of the time we knew when they were coming because we had someone on the payroll, but sometimes we didn't. So I remember just sat there in the kitchen, I'd have a dressing gown on and something underneath. I'd have to stuff loads of money around me. Um, that was in the house at the time, but we didn't want them to take, sat on top of a towel that was loose with a gun in it. They would never make me stand up and search me. So, it, it, because they didn't even look at us women, they didn't even contemplate that we could be hiding anything or, but whereas, obviously now it's different. It's a different world now, they do. And you know, <clears throat> the women especially, it's the double deviancy, a woman shouldn't be thinking like that. A woman shouldn't commit crime. She's a nurturer. She's, you know, a mother. And a, so you looked upon even doubly harshly in some ways mm -hmm. because of it. Yeah. How many people were in your family? 
So there was 12 siblings, but uh, the actual, uh, sorry, the first, the first wave of arrests, which was in 1992, that's when my father got, he was a fugitive in Spain then, um, wanted in Italy. And I think it was about 150 got arrested on the first wave. Obviously they weren't all family, but they're all connected. Mm -hmm. to the organisation. Um, I can't quite remember the second wave, which I was in as well, because it was everyone from abroad that were abroad that they were then arrested. I was back in the UK by then. And I got uh, convicted here of money laundering. Then they extradited me back to Italy for a charge of, as an, under an umbrella of organised crime. Am I OK? Of course it is. See that sort of kind of circle and environment like how much surveillance and how long is a surveillance on a family like that it was for a couple of years they couldn't they had that's what brought us down a lot of it was surveillance and talk talking Snatches. on the phone and then that people talking getting arrested but the main one was my dad's sister she turned to queen's evidence she was the first one that did it and then that was it because she did talk she talked about everyone uh, even her own son and the mother and the brothers and everyone. So, but she got arrested with a thousand tablets of ecstasy. And then it's all come out that it was my uncle's merchandise. She'd lost him some money. She was trying to get more money. So she pinched these tablets to try and gain back, make money out to give back. But he was quite ruthless with her. And this woman I hated for a long time because she put us all inside. And then I found out certain things, what happened to her, and I thought, hmm, I can sort of, I get it. Because that's not really, since doing my criminology, I think more. Because mm -hmm. it is a man's world, that world. And when they never look at the women and how, you know, the women suffer quite a lot. <clears throat> There's a lot of abuse goes on. It's not something that's talked about, and I don't really rarely talk about it, but a lot of, you know, abusers in in certain ways. They are very much, you know, like very old school <laughs> with women. Um, Physically then, and mentally? Yeah. So, not myself, thankfully. You know, that would never happen. Not with my because dad. Because your dad was? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I had my, some uncles. I've had some slaps. I've had one kick me in the face. <laughs> but wow. I did say it was harsh. I did say, well, because it's about my dad and I was so mad with him. I said, oh, you should just go back to prison. And he just went, boom, and he just kicked me in. But I was... 17, <laughs> you know, it's like I'm laughing about it because uh, I've done too much crying already. But mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, actually, it was probably the first time I've talked about that. I'm not even sure I talk about that in the book. Was there much crying in your early years or was it just an excitement for you where you didn't even know what was going on? I didn't, it's like, it's weird. It's like Numb you're detached. It? Yeah. It's, I did a module on and criminology on terrorism. Mm -hmm. And they say, talk about how terrorists are detached to what they do and what and how their way. And it really upset me. I nearly cried in a lesson because I felt like that's how I was. I was so detached from the rea the reality, the real, the seriousness. No, no, I had no, no one, an elder come to me and say, if you do this, this is what's gonna happen. It's all right to have it at the back of your mind and you're young and you think, oh, yeah, but it's not going to happen to me. But if someone had pulled me and said, right, because most of the elders had been inside already. I'm talking about my family and my dad and my nonna. So that's how it feels. I can't, there's no excuse then. I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to be a, a, a victim because I wasn't a victim. Mm -hmm. Probably to myself, I was a victim to myself. Like I was so easily led into things. And, but, you know, saying that, so I've made a point when we did the book, I didn't want anything glamorous, because it's not glamorous. It can be glamorous, of course it can. You've got nice things in it. But you're, you're risking. You haven't, you're looking behind your shoulder all the time. It's not a nine to five, but it might be four till four, four in the morning till four. Do you know, it's not a glamorous world of, you know, you're not laid out in bed all day. The way they move and, is trip. Yeah, you are, you work. You have to work. My father made sure I worked. I could have, his women didn't. <laughs> he could have easily not involved me in 
I could have lived a good life with him. But he didn't do that. He made sure that I did. Mm. That, and, then, and I suppose I want to show him that I could do things. Looking for acceptance. Yeah. What sort of stuff was your dad involved in? Um, it was mainly drugs. How was that though? I thought, like the mafia, were they not against selling gear? Or was that just, well, is that a myth? Well, it's, yeah, it's a myth because of the <clears throat> biggest exporters of cocaine goes through Gioia Tauro in southern Italy. 80% of it goes through there. And I think they don't like to be the dealers on the streets, but they can be the traffickers because that's what we were, traffickers. So, you know, it's from A to B. So they did, they did dealt in the 80s heroin. They, my family lost three siblings through that. So my nonna paid a heavy price for that. You know, being involved in that, there's someone got hooked on it and they died through it. They were only 30 and 29. Another one was even younger in the 80s. So... Uh, Do you believe karma takes part in this? Yeah. My nonna, she was massively into the church and she used to give so much money to the church. She would earn it, but they'd give it. Because she was, you know, when she met a maker, she didn't want to, she wanted to show the balance. But this is a woman that hadn't gone to school. She couldn't read, write. She signed with her necks as a signature. But she was so clever. She was in that, I mean, till she died four years ago, she was 86, 87. She was on house arrest. She was with a Zimmer frame. No lady, because the, the authorities said, well, your brain still works. We, we are scared. She's dangerous. I mean, she's in the Italian Archibalds, which are the law books in Italy, as the highest, ma highest ranking mafia woman. I don't think anyone's ever been as high as she was. But this is a woman that was born into it, and that's all she ever knew. How big was your dad's empire at the height of it? Um, well, there was nine countries involved, so the we were well. It was supplying cannabis all over um, Europe. So we, sorry, excuse me. We'd supply uh, so people in Holland. They would give us ecstasy tablets. You know, it's a swap and swap. Mm. Um, there was in one the security box. My dad had to put a lot of money in security box, even though I had a Geneva Coots, the Queen's bank account in. In Geneva, I had that in my name, and at one point, we had about 1.6 million in that, and in all different accounts. One of them had 700,000 pounds cash. And I didn't know about that because I said to my dad, Why didn't you just let me sort that out? It was English money, you know, looking back. I mean, silly now, but it's just things like that that you. So there's a lot of countries involved. He worked with people, quite well known people in London. They actually owe him money, <laughs> but it's, that's much? all gone now. And it's a bit, it's a few mm. hundred thousand um, because he got arrested. And they're quite, quite well-known family. You probably guessed who they are. Did your uh, dad know it was coming on top for him? Or did they always think he was untouchable? He was, I always thought he was untouchable because he's, he's escaped. He was in. He got arrested in 91. And he bribed um, a prison doctor because he'd been shot years before he's been shot twice in two places on his legs so he's always having to see the doctor and consultant gets all these aches and pains sorry and in prison he said he had this issue with the doctor went along with it so he had a prison um hospital visit so all his soldiers as you will that worked for him were already in waiting he went six in the morning and um they got him out it was quite a big because the underneath the the, the hospital name, but they went under the, underneath our corridors, so he wasn't where the public was. But all these guys were dressed like doctors, and and they all and they had the first stunt gun. It was just come out in America, and we managed to get one. And it was a big hype because there was no, no not even the police in Italy had the stunt gun. So it, and one of them dropped it, and <coughs> the guy, the guard that I was actually taking my dad, I said to him. If anything happens, you're the first one down. And this guy, this guy, after when his my dad's guys came and that, he actually peed himself physically, which is quite sad to bit. But I thought, well, do you know what? You're the first one down acting all the man, and then he actually peed himself. Yeah. So my dad got out of there, went to a restaurant that 
was friends with had a right big lap up me while helicopters and everybody was looking for him. He was in a restaurant in a cent just down the road from it. It was crazy. Then he got out. Cause he used to use um, this is all, this is all in uh, on the trial papers. So I'm not saying anything. That was dirt. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we used to use um, <clears throat> a big bus to bring across the cannabis. There'd be tons of cannabis. A tour bus to so go into Spain from Italy, touring with holiday makers, tourists, and underneath it there was an extra. Uh, sort of shelving being done to put either money or the merchandise, which is cannabis. And uh, he got out of Italy going under that, what his merchandise used to. That's he got out. By by the time, you know, 10 hours later, he rang us. We were in Rimini by the sea because I'd just locked my house. I thought they're going to come and raid me now. I'm going to go. I was pregnant, actually, at the time. <clears throat> we were in Rimini and he called and went, I'm here safe when he was in Spain. So we're all drinking champagne and celebrating because my dad was out. So this is what I'm trying to say. I was so detached from it. That become that was my life. I can't even explain sort of, you know, how it's, you can't explain it. It just becomes your life and you're not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. I can see that. It's, you know, I'm, I, I'm not, uh, but you just, you make decisions but you carry them for the rest of your life as well. Of course, man. It, at that age as well, when going through that life, you do anything for your family. It's trust. If you're, if aunties and other people are turning against the family, then who do you trust? If you know you're 100%, then you do everything for your mum and dad, no matter mm -hmm. if it's right or wrong. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Someday, my mum phones me, or my, and if my dad ever phoned me and was in trouble and it was the worst thing possible, would I help him? You fucking better believe I would. Yeah. Would I agree with it? No. But it's family, isn't it? You yeah. die for them. You're, yeah. You were there to protect. As a father as well, you, you should be protecting your daughter. But he's too caught up in that. If he's the leader of a family, yeah. he don't see that. Do you mm. know what I mean? He don't see Yuri's baby daughter. He's just saying, keep it in the family. Yeah. And that must be the hard thing. Do you, mm. like, do you live with that regret? Like, why? Knowing that you've got kids now? Yeah, I mean, he he's actually apologised to me. How was that? He said he's, he was sorry that he got me involved, that he didn't understand it. He was grown into it. That's all his life. All he ever did was move from one place to another, to another, to another. I mean, he'd earn about a million a week. <laughs> you know, this is a guy that, and you know what? Now he's changed his life around. He's a qualified chef. He's so humble. He doesn't have much and he doesn't, but he's he just doesn't, he, he knew so my dad eventually, after 13 years, he was inside. He got a letter from my younger sister. She's Slovakian. Saying, I feel like an orphan. You're in prison. My mum's in prison. I feel like an orphan. I feel like... And it just changed something in him. And he... So you've got to understand, when my family got arrested, a lot got life. They got 30 years plus because we were involved in military weapons and sending them down south to a war that my family was in down south. They actually won it. And I'm talking about Kalashnikov, um, bazookas, and, you know, so, and they won that war. My, my father funded it and sent it. I took it down on one trip. I risked my life. What did you take down? It was on, a, on just a thing of the car. It was a, it was a bazooka and some Kalashnikovs. Actually, that's in my book. And I mean, I'm smiling now. It's not funny, but it's that's like... That's proper gangster, it's like, if I'm honest. Yeah, no, sick. but I took them down. So I, we stopped. I'll never forget. We stopped at a petrol station right next to two parked police cars. <laughs> and he does that. Right next to them. Went in, got a sandwich. Right, got back in. Drove off. I mean, who does that? We didn't park, the car park was massive. It was like almost like, well, it's so much under your nose that you're not going to notice that. You know, but it, but it was scary. It was, I was, uh, to be fair, it was with my daughter's dad. And there was other people, but I'm never going to mention them. And there's a lot of things that I don't say or mention names. And when we got down there, do you know the thing that scared me the most? Which is, is crazy. I've just driven down 10 hours with all that. Um that my uncles were like, oh, do you want to come out shooting in the mountains? I was like, no, there's a war going on. I was horrified that my then future husband was going to get shot. 
so it was a bit like surreal. I was like, I've just drove down with all this. Yeah, I wasn't, I could have got 20 years inside for that. But when I'm going back to what I was saying, my family got a long time because of that. And because my, my father's sister went grass, the family didn't want to know. And it was wrong that it was harsh on my father that, and on all of us, the sacrifice we made. For, for We didn't get anything from it, mm -hmm. apart from helping the family. And my dad doesn't talk about this, but I, I, will, I do because it, you know, I, of course I've got family down there that are still going. But I think it's hot. I think it's not right. You know, it's unfair what they did with my father. He did 13 years inside. And then, as I said, going back to that, my sister wrote, and he knew then he was either going to die in there or he was going to die going out because he was going to lead the same life. So he decided to uh, collaborate with Justice. So he told him exactly what he'd done, he gave up more, more properties, which I'm laughing because one of them was mine and I didn't want him to give that up. <laughs> but um, it was a villa in just outside Milan. And, uh, you know, and, and he did that. And he went as an expert witness on one trial, which the guy was already getting life. But my dad does regret that now. But that's that's what he did. So people can say, well, oh, well, he's a he's turned against. He's a. I never thought my dad would, to be honest. Why? Just the upbringing and the. You just stop. I didn't. <laughs> Is that a matter? Do you take off? Uh, Omerta. 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 Yeah. Because I had Michael Francesi on, and he spoke about Omerta. Yeah. Well, you know, with the difference, you're going back to the Americans. The difference they made. We're not made because we're born into it mm -hmm. that's the difference we don't need to be made are you made if you're outside of it if you're the brother-in-law or the so that's that the so madonna di montagna to get in yeah they go up to the mountain in calabria mm -hmm. there's, there's a i think it's in august who's the biggest uh, family in the mafia in italy who's the biggest family yeah. oh god there's there's a few of them that's that you wouldn't i wouldn't like to say which one's the biggest as in i think they all Actually, there's a thing, there's a current, um, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, um, Matteo Messina Denaro, that's just been arrested after 30 years in Sicily. In the last week, have you not seen that? No. Yeah. Well, it's 30 years he's been on the run. And he was arrested in hospital, he's got cancer. A private clinic close by to Trapani, that's the area. So his father was the main guy, he died and his son took over. They worked with... Totorina, I don't know if you've heard of him. So these people have blew up the judge on the motorway in the 90s, um, Falcone, the judge, then there's Borsellino. And so this guy just been arrested. He was the guy that Totorina, which was the boss of bosses in Sicily up to 10 years ago, 10, 15. He relied on this Denaro as his hitman. If anything was to be done, and my father was telling me he met them. He knew them all. They met in a meeting in, in Calabria in 89, 90. Because he'd done a dealing with someone in Sicily, in Palermo. And this guy didn't want to pay. So my dad went to them and said, right, I don't want to start any violence or anything on your territory, but this guy's not paying. You either tell him to pay or I'm going to have to. I'm asking your permission to come and do something to him. Because <laughs> it's this, because that's how it works. You can't step on each other's toes and... um. So they, of course, sorted it out and made sure that my father got paid. But it's weird how these things, but if you look up on it, there's a big thing about it now because, and then they're saying, I'm doing a Turkish TV interview next week. And they're saying, they were asking why they thought, well, he's never, he's, only, he's probably gone for a month or two. He's always been there because the, the boss can't go far because he's dog eat dog. They'll take his territory if he does. Everybody probably knew he was there for 30 years. The police will have been corrupting it. And one thing nobody's looked at is he's dying of cancer. He sacrificed himself somehow. That's what I believe. Because there's probably so much heat on other things that he wants to take it from that. And saying, here's me. Put the heat on me. I'm dying anyway. See, when there's a war between the mafia and Italy, like when you're talking about dropping off bazookas and AKs and that, how big is it? It's not just a case of as a family grievance here, maybe somebody gets killed. It's not that big here. 
a bit over in Italy. Like, how Aye. big is the war between mafia oh, families? It's, it's like a, it's like a war zone. It's literally a war zone. You know, you go down to signs in Italy; they're all got bullets in them. You know, welcome to Blackpool. <laughs> there be bullets in them. So you know, when I look at the gangsters here, that think you know, and everything that's going on, I'm not taking away that the mean and whatever, but that's a whole different level over there. But it's also a level of respect. I know they, they have stooped low with children and women involved in that in Italy, but that's very rare. Well, over here, I mean, the little girl that was killed in Liverpool. Yeah, it's wrong, that. And actually, what I try and do now, I'm trying to get in schools, actually. Because I feel there's all this gender fluid thing, there's all this, is so important. Actually, what's important is that children are getting stabbed outside of school. And you need someone to go in and tell them that it's not right, that it's not all that great. And unfortunately, they only tend to respect someone like myself. Because you tell them about authorities, and they don't care. The policeman goes in to talk to them. But if you bring in someone that's been in the mafia, they're like that. <laughs> you can see it. You know, and, and the two take more note. I mean, I've had experience of it with my children in the past. Um, when my daughter was in the house and these two lads trying to get on top of my front door and on climbing on my house and my neighbour, I was away for the day. She was 14 and my neighbour told me and I said, right, to this other kid, I said, point them out if they're here. There's a park just down the road. Two weeks later, he said, oh, them lads are at the park. So I went to them. First thing they did, put the camera out, started recording me. I said, who do you think you are coming to my house, climbing, it's not your property, blah, blah, blah. Next time I call the police, ah, oh, yeah, police, um, whatever, you're a pedo. Well, I, as soon as I heard that, and I, I, I was a bit ashamed after, but then I thought, I said, how dare you call me that? I have not done four years inside for a little shit like you to tell me. I'm a pedo. Who do you think you're talking to? And they were like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. We thought you were a nine-to-five secretary. So I've had experience of it. That unfortunately, because you feel a bit stupid to having said that to a kid, but they tend to push your teenagers to a level of like, hang on a minute. So, and I can I know that that, and so now it's like try and show these these kids that it's not good, mm -hmm. it's not great, mm -hmm. it's not. It's like the all the Andrew Tate stuff. Sorry that I'm That's saying okay. mentioning that because my son is 22. Oh, Andrew, Tate. I'm horrified. Who is this? It's a gangster. He looks like a gangster, but he's not. <laughs> he's acting like one. He's ch ch chauvinist, because he is. Chauvinist pig. Do you know what I mean? And I think, yeah, listen, each to their own, however they make the money, good luck to you. Respect in that way. If you, hopefully it's not through trafficking of women or whatever's going on. We don't know. I like to think, let's wait. Do you know what I mean? I'm yeah. not going to judge straight away. Innocent, Let's wait. Innocent to prove and go. Well, we like to think that, but mm. not when you're waiting on remand <laughs> somewhere <laughs> like where I was in yeah. Durham. What do you think the difference is between the gangsters in the UK and the mafia? There's no comparison, is there? There's no... The mafia, it's a lot more of a family unit. There's a lot more lines you don't cross. The people on the street tend to, even though, yeah, there's an uproar about the mafia because maybe someone's got shot that is innocent. Just like, but that rarely happens. But most of the time, they're giving to the neighbours, they're protecting the neighbours, they're helping the neighbours. You know, if someone needs treatment for cancer, here you are. And that's what they do. But that's, that's not just, obviously it's for their own gain because they want to keep everything, you know, they don't want shootings on the street because it brings the heat on. So they can't do all their operations. Whereas over here, they don't care. They should be thinking more about, hang on a minute, if this happens, there's a feud about what? Someone ran into the car and smashed the car. I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, what is this feud about? Is it that strong that you're going out shooting also innocent people on the street? Is it worth that? It's discipline. It feels like there's no discipline. If you're in that life of crime, you've got to live by the, the, the rules and regulations What comes with that life, do you know what I mean? If you're stepping out of line, if you're doing whatever and people get killed, then you've kind of signed up for that. But 
it's the innocence of the people who get caught in the crossfire here for like you say here that, that people think they're bigger than what they are people yeah. watch a few films here and they actually think they're from the mafia that like, it's just crazy how we see the world but how does a young girl like yourself then take over the family business that like, what what was the steps to that so as i said my father got arrested in it was actually portugal he got arrested in 93 And by this time, I was my husband was arrested, my Italian husband, my first husband at the time. And <clears throat> I used to go every weekend to visit them. I used to go to Madrid prison to see my husband then, then fly on to Lisbon, go to the prison there, fly back to Milan on the Sunday. So this would be every weekend for about a year. And on the weekends, my father used to give me notes to give to his guys. So all I would like to say, well, I took over. I didn't take over. I was my father's voice. So to me, I'd, I was, I, you know, people say, well, I took over. And people like to think that actually it's not. I was relaying his voice. Of course, the logistical side of it, there'd be times where his voice, I couldn't just ring him. or And I had to make some choices myself. So I guess in that way, you could say you, I was running it. Um, but I just had good good guys around us, loyal guys that that helped me along. I mean, even my own uncle tried to take over and he sent word to say, I'll just give her a kick up mm. the uh, bottom and send it to me. And I said, well, really? <laughs> you know, but you've got to think I was 23, just had a baby. So I was a really young girl. And, you know, when when I did my book, and again, it was like a therapy for me. And my ghostwriter, Douglas Thompson, he said, I said, to him, how can they have given me such responsibilities? I've got a child, you know. By that time, my daughter was probably about that age. <coughs> Sorry. And how could it give me such responsibility to me? And he said to me, well, you must have shown that you could take it. You must have shown, because he doesn't automatically, you know, you see these mafia movies and now, so automatically goes to the, the firstborn, it automatically, you know, the, the responsibility. But it's not like that they have to show that they can do it. But I hadn't, that hadn't even entered my mind that they could see that I was responsible enough. To me, I was just like, right, well, I'm going to have to get on with it now. I can't leave. I tried, as I had my daughter, it was a big slap in the face. I thought, oh, my God, I've got another, I've got a responsibility as my child. But unfortunately, I'd already committed the crime. And even though I tried to pull myself back because that happened of my father being arrested, I was pulled back in. And I had to step up and do what needed to be done. And that was for about a year. How hard is that decision? Newborn, dad's in prison. The kid would have been the past to go, I'm out, I'm done. You must have had money tucked away. Like. But how hard was it when your dad was in prison to choose that life with your dad? Was that, again, to get that acceptance and been willing to... That was to the loyalty. The loyalty. And the love. Is that what it comes down to? Yeah. That was loyalty and love. It wasn't about... I didn't even understand about the acceptance till now. Mm -hmm. Before it was that, oh, I'm going to show it. <laughs> when, as I was in the organisation, as I was taking money, I used to take hundreds of thousands to get cannabis, you know, and um, to Spain. Uh <laughs> I used to have it Bridget Jones knickers, you know, on the, on the airplane. You wouldn't dream of that now. Mm -hmm. But there's no, there was no laundering, money laundering laws then. You could do what you wanted, really. Uh, in fact, they're saying that's probably one of the people that bought that law in because it was a big, it was a big um, thing then because of what I'd done. I'd, I'd had transferred monies from Switzerland, bought a show house, <laughs> but. Um, I just thought I was I thought I was untouchable, I guess. You know, it's just Do you see a lot of yourself in your dad though? I never thought I was like him, but do you know what? Yeah. And even some of my uncles have said the apple doesn't fall far from the tree because of some of the decisions that I've made. Even about writing the book. They're like, Well, you like your dad, you'll and I'm like Actually, I wrote that because I couldn't get a job and I had no career and I kept being asked to do it. And in the end, and the 
I'll tell you this, they, they arrested a guy from the Gamora. He was on the run, he was a hitman. He had a limousine hire firm and rented a house in Garstang, which is near Preston. I lived just 20 miles from him, but they decided that I must know this guy, the national newspaper, I must know this guy. I must have helped him rent his house and I had the same bank account, which was Barclays. And I'm like, we're so doing millions. I'd never set eyes on this guy before. And then they just wrote this out. And then I got older, my solicitor said, how can it, well, you're convicted, you're convicted, you can't do anything about it. I said, this isn't fair, I've been out 10 years and they still persecute me. So then I was, and someone else reached out to me about doing a book and I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it now because I want to tell my side of it. Of course, there's a financial side of it because, you know, I couldn't, a good job. I couldn't have a career. I couldn't, you know, up to five years ago doing my uh, my degree, I was a, a self-employed cleaning. I lived in a council house for 20 years. I only just moved out a few years ago. I was born in one and I thought I'd die in one. So it, it's not, you know, it, but it was more my children. I did it for them to have a few, to be able to have something too. And as I said, doing a degree as well, and it's opened a lot of doors. I do talks and that, not just such as this, you know, I go and, and, and it's earn, earning me a living with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's also Amazon did a um, series based on my book this year. Mm -hmm. um, it came out in April. It's called Bang Bang Baby. What at first I mean? thought, well, at first I thought, it sounds a bit pornographic that I'm not so I'm happy <laughs> with that. <laughs> so I was like the first uh -huh. initial and then, you know, the song, um, Nancy Sinatra, bang, bang, you shut yeah, yeah. me down. Yeah. That's where, so it's Bang, Bang, Baby. So it's an Italian series. It's dubbed now. Um, I think it's 10 parts. And it's the, the plot is completely different to my life story. They've completely changed it. Um, they've put some things in which is a bit controversial. I'm not sure my family are very happy with that. But the relationship between my father, my nonna and myself is quite good. Mm -hmm. They've brought that in about with my father, you know. What's the what's the daily routine like for a mafia boss? Well, you're always here, there, and everywhere. So you could be last minute. You've got to catch a plane to Spain. You've got to catch a plane to here, or you've got to go and do this. It's not. There is no such routine because you here, there, and everywhere. It's it's whatever you know. It, how can how, of course it's not. And the nine to five, and that's what people are like, oh, well, it must be glamorous then because you are catching a flight to that and you are. But, but yeah, I guess, you know, you're flying here and then everywhere, but you're looking over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, and then you get caught and then you're doing 20 years. I got 14 years altogether. You know, fortunately for illegal technicality, I ended up doing four. But it, I should have been out far later. Um, so going back the routine, there is no such routine because it's every day is different. When did the house of cars come tumbling down? Uh, like, when it's when it it my, my father's sister got arrested. And how long ago, how far along was that since um, your dad got arrested? This was 92, 1992. So we're talking 30 years this year, mm -hmm. last year, 30 years. Does it feel like yesterday? No, not now. Nah, I've moved on. No, I, it did do. Mm -hmm. It's taken a long time to let go of certain things and uh, your own demons, I guess. And like we said, you know, to find some sort of peace. Because, you know, indirectly, I know people got hurt. And I'm conscious of that and I carry that. But, you know, I, I did my time inside and there's a lot more. You either go in and you realise on your first day, I do not want to come back in here. Or, no, or it's a vicious circle, mm -hmm. like people keep going back in. And it's obviously not touching them or it's not making, because I don't think prison works anyway. Uh, there's, I think there should be, other, of course, with some, you have to lock them up, mm -hmm. the really bad ones. And the, and that's going on to, you know, HMP Durham. I was in with Linda. Linda Calvary, the Black Widow. Yes, I was in with her at that mm -hmm. time. And... Uh, Mary Hinley, Rose West, came in. Uh, so we was walking across corridors, crossing them. You know, horrible, horrific thing of 
Rose in the shower <laughs> coming out and she's like that, naked. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, she was on remand then. So it was like, well, did she do it? Did she not do it? He's just hung himself. We didn't really know what. Because, of course, when you're in there, you're not got like, oh, you did that. And a lot of them do say I'm innocent. And you're like, well, but the mask comes off after a certain time. When you're around people, you know, you can't have the pretenses all the time. Sooner or later, you see, actually, I can see you doing that. Mm -hmm. What was Maya Handler like? Uh, menacing. Presence was menacing. There's an aura about her. You can't, I can't really explain. I remember she came across the landing once and she's just looking at me up and down. It really made me cringe. I mean, I was 25, 26. I was fit. I was in the gym four hours a day, you know, I was, and she had tendency to like women, didn't she? And I was like, oh God, don't look at me. You know, it's like, but, <clears throat> and with Rose, it was weird because she's like the next woman on Tesco crew. It's like, but actually there's certain things about her that did sort of, um, she just, you can sort of see. As mm -hmm. I say, with time, it shows a person. Um, I mean, I was in with the two IRA, Martina and Ella, the ones that bombed the Brighton bombing in 86. They were, because I was a double cate prisoner because of the mafia connection. And they were the first ones to take me around Durham. And at first I thought, oh, I feel, I feel a bit like a VIP because I'm getting shown around. Whereas Grizzly Risley was horrific. Grizzly Prison in Warrington. There was a female unit then. And then I got taken to Durham and I thought, oh my God, it's so far from home. And I did, it just didn't, it took about two weeks to trigger in my head. This is a prison within a prison. These are all lifers. I'm never going to get out of here. I actually thought I would never get out of here. Mm -hmm. That's a scary thing, and it? See when, was it your auntie? It turned against everybody. Yeah. But what was that feeling? Did, was that totally out of the blue, or was there always a suspicion that she was a, a, a suspect that she could have done that? No, it was out of the blue. But actually, afterwards, when you look at it, she was the weakest link. How so? She was on amphetamine, slimming tablets. She's crazy anyway, like, crazy. But she, she's... And that, she was nice as well. I liked her as an auntie. Um, but she was always cra doing cr crazy shit. <laughs> you know, there's never... Can I swear? Of course <laughs> you can, yeah. It's anything goes. Just, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. Anything goes. Yeah. Um, I don't like women swearing. <laughs> it's like, listen, but sometimes fucking, when I get... No, listen, you but... You've driven about with fucking bazookas and, and you've <laughs> driven about with bazookas and grenades. I'm sure you fucking swear. <laughs> <laughs> see what I mean it's uh, just crazy it's like one extreme to the yeah, other it's crazy uh, um, but she was a nutcase yeah she was yeah so, yeah she was she do, she just would do really like whereas my other aunties were all really mellow uh, yeah most of them were involved in the family business there was only about three or four that were did you ever look at them and feel envious no they might have been the other way around mm -hmm. jealousy towards you didn't yeah, because I was, my nonna loved me. I was the daughter of her firstborn. She, my dad was a favourite. My dad was the one that was bringing in everything, the making the money. And there's a few that were sponges mm -hmm. because they, they didn't know, but they wanted that life, but they didn't want to get the hands dirty. And my dad used to go, my said, we can't do that. And not, you know, look, he's involving his own daughter. So he's like, well, no, they've got to get up and do something. If anything, it was the other way around. And I'm not saying that they were... I'm not saying that they were confrontational with me or they were nasty. Or no, I had none of that. They all loved me and we're all together. But if you look back on it, looking back on it, there's certain things that I think... And mainly, probably, my, my uncle's wives. You know, there's a few that were a bit sort mm -hmm. of... Uh, mm. So your dad gets to jail, the auntie turns, like... Was the, the, the falling of the house kind of when your dad got went to prison? Like, did things start yeah. tumbling down yeah. then? Did yeah. you see the cracks? Like, it was too hard to keep together? Yeah. Well, especially when you're fighting your own family, when your own mm. uncle wants to take over. It's not good, is it? Could your dad so, not have got to him? Um, I don't even think that I actually told my dad at the time because I didn't want to cause... I didn't want to cause a war. I didn't want... 
the crack to get even bigger. Mm-hmm. I thought I could handle it myself, which I did. And he didn't push it any further. So it was years later that my dad found out about that. What was your auntie? What was she offered to turn? Uh, immunity. But for a uh, thousand pounds, she would have only a couple no. of years. Well, so this is this is it. This is what I found out years later through her children that she'd had just miscarried, and that someone else dubbed her in and made a call to the police that they let her listen to and she knew that person it was a family member she was devastated that a family member rang in but it was all to do with this baby and the man she was with this family member was having an affair with this man it was just typical you know (laughs) you think you see things and and she just miscarried because it kicked her down the stairs this is what I'm talking about, the abuse, the abusiveness mm. of... And she was at a place, God knows, in her head. This is a woman just miscarried, being kicked down, found out that her partner's having an affair with another member of the family, which was from outside the family anyway. I don't want to name names or... And I'm like, well, actually, I get it. <laughs> her head was fucked. Excuse my... You know, she was gone. I'm not making excuses for her, and I'm not saying it was right what she did. She was vulnerable. The police pulled her in. Listen to that. She knew exactly who that voice was. That was it. It was done. You know, and years later, she has said through other people, she regrets it. She wished she didn't do it. So as far as concerned, she we thought we should do it. No, never. Never for any of my family member would do that. But she was the most craziest one that would have, <laughs> would have, you know, the weakest link, like I said. So see when... When did you then get the charge? When did you start getting charged? I got arrested in June um, 1994. So nearly 30 years ago? Yeah. And your dad, he was already in prison at the time? Yeah. But your, your nana got 30 years as well? Yeah, she got life. <laughs> they got they both got life because... They would say, no, you're like, wow, it's like, you, you can't... I could go on forever just saying yeah, that... But um, so what happened was while everything was going on in our territory in Milan, Mm -hmm. a Gamora boss came up and said, right, there's a guy that lives in your territory. He's done this, that and that. It's not right. We're going to kill him. He's shown us up. He knows what line to cross. He's already crossed us a little bit before. He's crossed it again. Can we have your permission to kill him? Now, what people don't understand and realise is that if someone like that comes to you and you say no, you could potentially start a war with them. Or they'll go, oh, why not? And what's your problem? And start some sort of feud. So it's not as easy as like, oh, well, um, God, it's bad for business, isn't it? You don't want that. You don't. So my nonna and, and you know what? I was there at that meeting when that happened where they gave the go-ahead. It was in the kitchen at my nonna's house. But I was there by chance. I was just a young girl getting a glass of water. <laughs> I wasn't in the meeting, sat there, but that's how open they were. And I, I knew so much, and I knew this guy was going to get killed, and I knew his kids, I knew his wife. And when people ask me, what's the hardest thing that you've had to sort of carry... And it was not knowing that guy was going to get killed the next day and I couldn't do anything. But what I was supposed to do, tell my family, oh, no, you can't kill him. Go to the police. What What was I supposed to do? I was 19. <laughs> I was just a kid. You know, even I knew right from wrong, but it was bigger than me. It certainly wasn't my decision to make. And I think that's probably one of the things that I've carried that I felt really bad for because that was a directly something that I knew about that my family had allowed to happen. Even And they got life for that. It all came out and they got life for it. Even you, though they didn't uh, pull the trigger. What did you end up charged with? I got charged in the UK with money laundering. How much? Uh, well, they did 1.6 million, what was in the bank. Yeah. And then and I bought property here. And, and then in Italy, it was uh, organised crime. I got 10 years over there. <clears throat> what was the prisons in Italy like? Well, 
You would have been, you, but for the family name, would you be more secure in Italy? You probably got more respect from the prisoners mm -hmm. because of it. But you, it was secure like a Category A prison here. It was the same. It was a unit for high, high alta surveillance, that's what they call it, high security. Um, there was no training. There was no workshop, sweatshop. <laughs> there was no um, education. It was harsh in Italy in that way. You did it yourself. But then the other side of it was you didn't just get an hour outside. You got four hours outside, two hours in the morning, two hours. That's where I did exercise. I used to get all the girls out in Italy and with my ghetto blaster at the time. They allowed me to have it from the UK, from the UK prison, because I got extradited, you know, from Durham to there. And uh, I used to have them on the yard. Like, I used to say, come on, let's just do, like, cartwheels and headstands and be like, Oh, and it's silly things like that that, because the kid would do, but it made them, it was euphoric for them. It made them feel, so come down, we used to have a bit of a run and then like a step class, you know, outside and that. So that was good in that sort of sense. But then the crazy thing is the food. So, you know, Italians are very big on mm -hmm. the food. is like a cultural. So they let us have a camping stove in the cell to cook. I mean, you wouldn't dream that. In the UK, you never did be arsonists blowing the prison up. Whereas there, you just, oh, you have your cooking stove. And then on your, on your weekly shopping, you could have wine. It was cartons. It was the crappiest wine that you could have, you know, white or red. But some of the girls, we used to store it and used to sugar it and make it like martinis or what. It was really strange. It's like a birthday coming up. We'd always get pissed in it. I had actually some pretty good times in there. This sounds as if prisons, you have a really good time. You don't. Because you know what? They take you, they take your freedom away. They take your family from you. You never, you suffer. Of course you suffer. But yeah, and you, you're in there. But then you meet some of the best people that, good friends in there. Mm -hmm. They're in the same situation. They've done stuff. Listen, prison, it's, it, you're not, you know, if you, you get punished by a judge. Yeah, you go in prison, you're there to, people say rehabilitate. It's not rehabilitation because you're going backwards. It's habilitation because you want to go forward. Prison doesn't do that anyway. It's within that person. It's within yourself. I was talking about this actually. I worked with a, a university lecturer, Dr. Nicola Hardin at Lancaster. And some of the girls, I did a talk there and some of the girls are doing an assessment on me and my father actually he did a talk for them as well and um we were saying about how it's so much harder for us not to commit a crime everyday life people it's hard for them to commit a crime and it's easy to stay on the lane and with people like us when you lived a life like that i'm not saying it's me now it's not it's not you know but it's so much harder not to go beyond the law. Mm -mm. That's what I find, you know, with, and, and I never thought about that concept before because um, something came up with, to do with that. Sorry, go on, you were going to Oh, sorry, what's the, what's the difference between the English prisons and the Italian prisons? As I was saying that, you could go out, well, you could have, go out four hours more in Italy. You didn't have... You had association in one room, but you were locked in it. In England, you don't, you're free to roam about till a certain time. You can't cook in your room. <coughs> in the UK, you wouldn't dream of doing that. So it seemed you, you were in Durham prison, you get extradited to Italy, and that's yeah. when you got another 10. Yeah. So what yeah. are you thinking then? Like, when does it all sink into I you, thought, the life that you led? I'm never going to get out. I'm, which, obviously, you do, but you just thought, oh, my God, I'm going to be like, in my thirties, and I'm going to. My, it's not just that. It's my daughter. It's my mom. My daughter. I was so upset because of her. It's like when he actually extradited me. When I got released in Durham to face extradition charges, I had like ninjas on the roof. It was all. You can imagine double cat A. Mm -hmm. They're all like swarming, like, and I got rearrested, bombed in the car, and and I had this like trunk uh, with me. I never forget this black trunk. I don't even know where it come from. <laughs> it wasn't a suitcase, but normally you just have bin liners, HMP bin liners, don't you? See through. So, yeah, see through. I still got some of them somewhere <laughs> with all the stuff in it. 
uh, letters in that somewhere in the loft or wherever. And so uh, I ended up, they took me back to Durham. Now, I went to Ch Charing Cross Police Station. I went to Bow Street Magistrate was open then. Charged me, well, they said, right, you're going back to Italy. Took me back to Durham. Took me back down, went to Holloway. So by this time I'd been in inside two and a half years or whatever. So I was like, they wouldn't let me out. They wouldn't let me for fresh. I said, listen, it's not my problem. You've got no helicopter lines. That's what guys have to have. It's not my problem. I, I, by law, I should be able to go out and now it's not fair. It's not right. I kicked off a bit. Wow, which I never had. Because the next time they took me down, I went to Belmarsh. They shut a whole wing. It's men's prison. They shut a whole wing in the hospital. It's like a corridor. It's about six cells. They put a, a sheet on the on the window and said, right, if you go to that window, it's on the yard. The men won't leave you alone all night. And I thought, I bet they would do. I bet they'd be more respectful than that. But I didn't go to the window because I thought, no. Then they strip search me. And, you know, when you strip search, I'm presuming it's the same with the men, you have to strip search top half at one point, mm -hmm. put everything back on, bottom half. No, we had everything off. They took me everything off. Yeah, we had everything Made off. Made me squat. Is a men's everything off? Everything off. It's... Front, turn round, squat. Turn round, Well, over. women, it's not. Mm -hmm. Women, it's top half, bottom half. But they made me strip naked and squat. I was just coming from Durham Prison. Metal detector. Didn't ask me if I was on my period, sorry to be. <laughs> okay. Did it? And it was like, it was, it was horrible. Degrading. It's degrading, yeah. yeah. And I was like, it was two women, thankfully. It wasn't men. Oh, put your robe on. And I was quite upset about it, even though I'd been in. I was like, that's wrong. So I went I went back to Durham and I kicked off. I went, I spoke to my local MP. I really massively, I got an apology off the Director General, saying that should not have happened. Next time I went to Belmarsh, I had the Governor, Samaritan. Everybody was at my door, are you okay? Are you okay? But I shouldn't, that shouldn't have had to happen because they didn't know how to handle a woman prisoner. So if you don't know how to handle her, you shouldn't have her in in Belmarsh prison. But um, of course it was the security thing that but my dad had escaped three times from prison and it was a big organisation, wasn't it? And I, at the time I didn't understand. It was like, well, it's me. What am I going to do? But I understand it now, you know, that, so seeing you get extradited, but like, <clears throat> will you want to go away? No. Certainly. Or will you want to stay in England? Because of my daughter. I couldn't see my daughter then. It uh, was months before I could see her. And when was the last time you spoke to your dad when you went to prison? Oh, God. You it was years before. You uh, I could just, we just couldn't. We could write. We found, and we did write, but we couldn't speak because he was abroad. He was in Portugal. He was there for eight years. What was the prison like over there for him? Bad. They were like dungeons, cold, damp dungeons. How did he not get extradited to Italy? Because he he was uh, because he'd been trafficking in Portugal. He got arrested from a whole team of Italians, Spanish, Portuguese. But in the meantime, we had money. They found things and they rest and they so they charged him in Portugal. <coughs> they also sorry tried to make out that he was one of the ones that bombed the judge in Falcone, when I talked about at the beginning, which he wasn't involved in that. Well, they tried, you know what they're like over there, they'll make it this big mafia. And um, he, he did eight years there and then they extradited him to Italy to face murder, which was the go-ahead that he gave with my nan of the guy that was going to be killed in the area. Just better, sir. So, but then it got reduced to manslaughter. How? Because um, under the extradition treaty with Portugal, they would take there were other charges. It wasn't the charge of murder. But when he got to Italy, the charging with murder, and it was against the Convention of Human Rights or whatever the laws, you can't do one thing and then add on a charge of murder. So he fought it against it, and then he got down to manslaughter. Don't ask me how. It, 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 Italian law is completely different. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a prosecutor that um, investigates the offence. Where here you've got CID, whoever, depends who, investigate, give it to prosecution, prosecution, and it's all about court. In Italy, the magistrates are the police and court. Did your dad ever come in contact with Escobar? His cousin. 
with his cousin while he was in America. He did some dealings with him. What about Gotti? What was he like? Was he proper? He, yeah. Yeah, my father said he was. He was a boss of bosses over there. He was the biggest yeah. moneymaker that Mafia had ever had, was yeah. he not? Yeah. yeah. He, he, so Gotti, my dad had some dealings with him and Gotti wanted him to work for him, with him, for him. But because my father was his own man, he wouldn't have that. And of course, Gotti couldn't pressurise him with it because, as I said before, it's because you're from the old country and you've got your own family and behind you, it's not, he was, he was sort of untouchable, I guess, to Gotti, which is quite rare that, to have something like that because of, the, of where you're coming from. So, I mean, we've even been called like mafia royalty in a way because we've got the blood of lines of, of that. Mm -hmm. um, How was your dad treated when they started speaking out? Of course, well, everybody still weren't happy with it, you know, even though... What did they say? So I talked about the family down south, how we helped them mm -hmm. through a war and took all that risk so much. And, and then when my family got arrested, got 30 years plus because of the military weapons. So when they turned their backs on my father, that was wrong. Because my aunties started talking, they turned their backs on him. As I said, my father won't speak out against them, but I think I do. <laughs> and it's wrong. Because how is it my father's fault that his sister did that? And what? So he's done so much for you and my family got so many years to help you for a war that you won and then we're just disregarded. I think all of us, yeah, but not my father. It was, it was wrong. So there's so many things that people don't know about. That um, So, you know, a lot of people have said, don't blame your father for doing that because look what's been around him and look, and actually did 13 years before he did. He didn't just do it straight away like most people do. He was 13 years into his sentence when he decided to collaborate. So he never made a deal at the start to get a reduced no. sentence to then give no. other names? No. And he's never given any anybody else his name. He's told them what, and given them up hours, you know, more properties than that, like I said to you. So that's the difference of that. You know, when they say, I mean, I've had that. Oh, she's. I mean, I've been called a grass. You are. Awesome. I've done my time. What? Mm -hmm. I'm not a grass because I've wrote in my book. I wrote about me and what's in court. I've not wrote about anybody else. I've not wrote any names. I've not put anybody in it. I've done my time. So why are you calling me a grass? You know. All right. Yeah. Well, they don't. Well, actually, you do write books because you're turning a life around. You're having nothing to do with it. You get on with what you're doing. I get on with what I'm doing. I'm not hurting you. So what was the main reason for your dad to then talk about his past? Or was it, what was it? Because he knew, he, well, my sister had wrote to him and said, I feel like an orphan. And that, I think that pulled out, it's like something clicked. And he thought, well, I'm either going to come out, he's near the end of his sentence. I'm going to come out and I'm going to go back to that. I'm going to die. I'm going to die in here. And the only way he saw his life changing was if he gave up that life. But that was the only way he was going to give it up. And the irony is, James, that even now, he has people, they want to work with him illegally because they know he's like a money machine. He, they know how what he can do and what he can do. So all this about, you know, oh, yeah, the, 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 crim, the, you know, the other side of look at, upon my father is really bad. He's gone against his what he was born into and he's gone against... They still want to work with him. <laughs> no one knows that. Of course he won't, because he's like, no, he literally has changed his I'm proud of him for that, that he has changed his life. So that was like a confession? What's that? that yeah, with your father coming out at the end of his sentence, like a confession of his sins, kind of. Yeah, yeah, he sort of, uh, it, but to be he could have come out without doing that. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Mm -hmm. But where would you go and what would you have done? Gone back into that life. So... What I'm saying is, he's not like one of these that, you know, as soon as you get arrested, oh, I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to do time. There's a lot of them, isn't there? Yeah, Jeff. He... Who was, who was it, Sam of the Bull? Mm. Sam of the Bull. I think he was a hat man. He fucking just gave everybody up. Yeah, just like that. You know, it's like, yeah, that's right. Sam of the, Sam Sam of the, the Bull. Bull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, he wants, someone put something that he wanted me to go on his podcast. He's, he's out. He's yeah, 77, I think, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, 
there was something about that. How, um, do, how do you get out, out that life, Mar 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 How hard is that to get out that life? Is it either dead or prison? Yeah. Because it is over there especially. I mean, I was lucky enough to have this life over here. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. A lot of my family are just leading normal lives now. One's a dinner lady. <laughs> you know, it's it's quite humbling and good for her. She's out of it. She could start selling stuff and knows all the contacts and connections and they make, but then for what? To go back in there? This is the vicious circle all the time because sooner or later you go in. And do you know why? Because you've got weakest links. It's not you yourself, it's your weakest links. And you, end, you will end up inside. It doesn't matter what. And of course people get greedy. Oh, I'll give up tomorrow, I'll give up tomorrow. I'll make a million and give up. I'll make 500,000 and give up. Mm -hmm. And they don't because they become, become greedy, don't they? And yeah. How much was the police saying your dad was allegedly worth? Uh, well, they've got from deposit boxes. Uh, I don't know. It's probably. I mean, that's even without. If you're talking about with property, I don't know, about ten million or something, which wasn't a lot really, if you think about. It, but it was a lot in them days, thirty years ago. Mm -hmm. And he'd only he'd only been out three years. He was in prison, he had nothing. And he started, he lent money to buy this, he lent, gave money back and and within three years, he was distributing in nine countries. Mm -hmm. How much were they getting a kilo of hash for? Do you know? Oh God, it was in lira. I can't, I can't, I can't remember. It wasn't, it was resin. It was chocolate, because it was direct from the Sultan of Chocolate in Morocco. From the house? Mm, directly from him, from the guy. Well, he was the Sultan of Chocolate. Sultan is like an imperial, mm -hmm. like royalty, aren't they, over there? Um, I can't, I actually can't remember what, uh, but it was in, I mean, we, you used to like to smoke it sometimes, because the chocolate used to like, you can yeah, make it like, like a ball. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like putty, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I used to smoke it back then, you know. You used to have a big thing in it, just yeah, don't that. It used to get soft black, it used to be cold. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's it. And it was, it used to blow your fucking head off. But yeah, then, then it was really strong. We did that, came in and kind of it's kind of it changed, changed all that. Yeah, yeah people don't want it. I mean, house. resin is actually quite harsh as well. Yeah. So it would either be that or resin. Mm -hmm. um, so see, when you go through all that, then everybody's in prison. How many has actually get sent to prison? Probably about over two hundred of us. Yeah, but that's that's major. Uh. Yeah, like that is major. That's like, a whole family yeah. gone. I mean, do you know what though? The area that Piazza Prealpi was the area in Milan that my family ran. So everybody respected that area. No one had come in to try and ask the shopkeepers for a, you know, extortion and trying to get money. They wouldn't do that. And if they did, they go. The shopkeepers would come to my nan and go. They're trying to get money out of us. All right. So my nan would say, right, you. And they were like, oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry. And they'd like run away scared of, and and my, my nan used to look after everyone in the area. And even now they say, when I've gone back, oh, we miss your family. They used to look after us. Now the Albanians are in, don't care, they kill your grandma. So it's like, it's a continuation of a vicious circle and I'm not saying it's right and I'm not saying it's, course it's wrong but actually is it better the devil you know than the devil you don't mm -hmm. they, 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 they will always always be a mafia i can't see any way that that could ever be taken out because there'll always be someone else it'll never be taken out i've got asked that question do you think it'll ever be taken out no i don't because it's about family Mm -hmm. It's not about working gangsters in a group of gangsters. They're all out for each other. When it's a family, it's a family business. What was it like getting out? Oh, God, I got out. I was actually, because it was a legal technicality, I got out, which was really good, mm -hmm. before my time. And they told me on a Saturday morning, to, I had two bin liners, so after four years of category A, I couldn't even open a door myself. Or I just got chucked out in the street. I had to walk the end of the road and got on a bus and everybody's looking at me, oh, she's just come from the prison. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's like, it's embarrassing. 
but I was free. It was a hot day. I mean, it was June, June the 13th, uh, 1998. And uh, I remember the day, it was hot, and I walked out. It's, it was, I, I felt for a while it was really surreal. It was really, I was quite... I think I had a bit of post-traumatic stress in a way because it was so, I've become so institutionalised. You don't realise how much. But as I said, even opening a door, I used to have all my doors open apart from my front door. I couldn't have my doors closed. Um, I used to clean on a Friday, proper clean, like spring clean my house. Because I was used to cells, I used to move me about as a cat, eh? When the IRA started trying to escape, don't know if you remember in the 90s, they tried, mm -hmm. tried to escape. So security really stepped up. So they used to move the cat A's every month to a different cell. I said, I'm sure you want me to clean every bastard cell, <laughs> you know. And they're like, yeah, get in here. She's in there and she's cleaning, scrubbing the walls. And, you know, and you're like, and you've got it. Because I was like, oh, because it doesn't matter how much you scrub them. It's, you still feel dirty anyway. You're in a cell. But like you say, it wasn't a 14 year old. You, you possibly could have been institutionalised. Did you know you were coming out and you were going to make changes? Or was it difficult? I came out, I was 28. I used to have guys write to me from prisons in the UK all the time. I'm like this, I'm like that. And one day I got a letter from a guy. Never said who, how old he was. I said, oh, I'm a, cat, a prisoner. I hope they're treating you all right. Blah, blah, blah. Of course, but most people think I have an Italian accent or I don't really know much English. Had I come over a few years later, I would have, but I was nine years old, so I've got the typical Lancashire. <coughs> and uh, he said, um, I thought, oh, he sounds quite nice. I might, I, most of them, I used to say, oh, I'm, I'm, my husband wouldn't like it. Thanks, but no thanks, but my husband wouldn't like it. So I thought, I'm not going to be cruel and nasty, but I'm going to say, shut them down. But with Frank, I was like, it sounds quite nice. I might just have a pen pal. Anyway, I said, oh, you sound like an older guy, nice. And I thought, mm -hmm. And I remember one of the women, the women saying, well, you don't know that. So I was like, oh, OK. Next thing he writes back, well, I'm only 30, 32 or something. And, you know, but, and I was like, oh, God. And then he sent me a picture and I was like, oh, he's so fit. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's so nice. And then he said, look, Maurice, I've got something to tell you. He'd, he'd uh, robbed Leonard Jews in. It's called Lenny Juza Jura in Blackpool. He was from Leeds. He did an armed robbery and he got caught. He ran into a house and he said, look, Marisa, it could have been full of rugby players. I didn't know, but it was an old woman. And I held her hostage. He said, but I'm not an aunt. I'm not a thing. Actually, and then actually there's an article, this woman saying, oh, the gentleman, you know, gentleman Robin was making me cups of tea. He was mortified that he was, you know, the, the daughter came from work and he was holding him. And then, the, anyway, he gave himself up in the end. And but he felt really bad that he said to me, trying to say to me, "Look, I'm not that." And you know, it's all right. And then, it's time we used to write. And you know what? People say, and I had to really eat humble pie with that because I got to know him so well through letters. Sometimes when you're face-to-face -face with people, you think you know them. But when you're writing everything down, you don't tend to hold back. So with letters. So I fell in love with him. He fell in love with me. I fell in love with him. He told me he'd change his life. He was not going to come out to all that. Uh, yeah, he had a few hiccups with people that had let him down on the outside, but blah, blah, blah. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Next thing, I came out in 98. We're still writing. I went... I got extradited. We were still writing. He was still writing to me in Italy. I came out, went to see him. He was cat A, so I had to go through all the thing of getting the police coming round and saying, well, why are you doing I said, well, I'm, I love him. I, I did love him, but it was like a love of lust. at the time. No, it wasn't even lust. It was we were both in a bad place, vulnerable. We needed each other. Mm -hmm. I did. I did love him, but how did he I, get your address? I was in H and P. It was all over the newspaper. Oh, H and P Durham. She's in H and P Durham. So people, <laughs> so people just send you letters. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking creepy as well. But no, I no. One to send. Can we have your autographs? I'm like, no. <laughs> um, can, do you want a canary? <laughs> like no. Uh, you know. Do you want? And I was like, 
really weird request, <laughs> like, like what? And um, so that's what happened with Frank. And then I did fall in love with him. And do you know what? For he's quite, he's quite a ruthless guy. I mean, Charlie Bronson put him in his book. I, mean, I think he's in Legends about how he's like the real deal. He was he was ruthless and he was in like on the seg all the time. He didn't finger to the prison, which he made his prison time so much harder because he just wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't stand for it. And he's nonsense from the screws or mm -hmm. he was in a shit protest. He did everything. He was on the roof when they did the riots. Um, Were you attracted so, to that? No, because I wanted about, to try and get away from that. Yeah, but seeing you talk about the dad issues and you tend to see that those go down the route of an overpowering man or they tend to be quite aggressive or the kind of beast. Fucking loopy, like. Yeah. Did you? Did I you saw a soft side of him. Did you? Yeah. And then when I started visiting him, he was soft as shit. Excuse me. No, to right. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot. But women people make don't soft. see. Yeah, yeah. They women don't make... see that side. Yeah. And he has such a kind, generous, mm -hmm. beautiful side to him. Is he still alive? No, he died. He got shot. And what's his name? Frank Burley. Was he a problem? Got shot in Leeds. Yeah. Oh, well, he was... He's, but you he still went, with him when he got shot? Mm, I was three months pregnant. My son never met his dad. Which is, I went through... It was a hard time. It was harsh because I'd just come out of prison and I got myself in a situation where I'm in love with this gangster. That he told me that he was out of that. Then he came out, but his ego got too much for himself. He was like... And then people were trying to put... He was like, well, this, he wanted to open a nightclub in Leeds with his brother. He wanted, and I, he wanted to go legit but people were putting spanners in the works for him. He said, well, I've just done time. I kept my mouth shut and they're still trying to... And then he got... It was just tit for tat. There was shootings in Leeds in the early 2000s. If you look back on it, there's a lot of shootings and that. And um, he was one of them. But he'd just gone and shot someone in the leg. They were running away from it. The gun had... There was already a fault with it. It had gone off. They went over a six-foot fence. The guy behind him that was with him had the gun because Frank passed it to him. And there was a caravan and it, and it was it was 11 o'clock at night. There was a caravan and a garage. They'd gone to the end of it and on the drive there were people saying goodbye to some who lived there. So they had to pull back to hide. As the lad came over, the shot went off and he hit Frank at the back of the head. Now, I always thought there was a lot of enemies at that time and I thought, this had been done purposely because he had a lot of enemies. But then I've been told that it wasn't purpose and it wasn't. And uh, and the guy who did it, I went to see him. And he, some of his family members did see him and they believed him. I said, well, I want to see him. <laughs> and they wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let me meet the guy that had shot Frank. It was an accident. Well, I want to see him. I don't know. I felt like I, need, I needed to... For myself to see. To feel it? Yeah. You'd have known? Yeah. If it was legit and, or not? Yeah. They wouldn't let me. And uh, then I asked around about him. So he's long gone. So I can presume what that means. Yeah. Because he knew a lot about people as well. So I don't know. I'm making, I'm surmising here. But from my own opinion, if you've not involved, the first thing you do is go to the meet. The first thing you do is listen, no, no, no. But yeah. if you've got something to hide, these you kind of stay back yeah how does that make you feel giving birth to your daughter prison Th pregnant with your son hu husband dead now we go back to the karma thing like how much do you think plays yeah. a part in I your think, life well when I'm, I'm doing criminology now mm -hmm. I've talked about as I said it's like a therapy I've never really been to well I have but a very short time I was pregnant when I lost Frank my mum dying I went to speak to someone but it's not even you talk you talk not ashamed of saying it, you know. It's like <laughs> you got how much do you have to go. I've never taken pills. Probably I should have, <laughs> but you know I've never have. Thankfully, I never had to. Uh, although I'm hormonal menopausal now, and I'm on HRT, I've had to be because I'm, I'm going crazy. Yeah, but um, you, you, I, I think there's a pivotal moment when Frank died. I'd already decided in prison I didn't want that life. Unfortunately, I was in love with someone that was carrying on in that, even though I knew that he didn't want that. But I loved him. So again, loyal to him. 
Not that I want, but I didn't do anything to end, want to end up in there. So I was completely detached. He didn't involve me in anything to do with whatever he was doing. I was back at home and back in Blackpool. He was in Leeds. <laughs> that pivotal moment was when he died and it's completely... <coughs> so sorry. I've not got over this yet, have okay. I? Um, he died and... That was a moment that I thought, I'm never going to date a criminal. <laughs> I'm never going to date a cop. I always knew that anyway with a cop, but I'm never yeah. going to date a policeman. I'm never going to date a criminal. So I've dated electricians. I've dated my, my husband's a mechanical engineer. <laughs> he's a nice guy. You know, he's, he's got an edge to him. You know, he's... He, you know, he's Do you he's need a, that? I think normal, what is normal anyway. I'm not put, normal. If a, if a man's coming into your life and he's soft, you're going to walk right he's over run. the top of him or you're going to run a, a mile, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you've been through, like I say, you're driving about with fucking bazookas. You're not wanting just the average Joe who's... Yeah. Because you're living a lie then. Because we all want a quiet life, but something kind of misses where you think, mm, I still want a bit of something. Do you know what I yeah. mean? It doesn't have to be as extreme as shootings and no. drugs and no. all the other yeah. madness, but you still need a man... You've been through men who's protected you your whole life. You can't be, and this is only me mm. having my own opinion. I don't think you could ever be with somebody who was soft. Or a... they couldn't. Uh, the, the thing is, a lot. But I've been, I've been out with a few. I've not been out with many anyway, but with a few, and they've been quite big characters as well. They've been quite well mm. known, some of them. And I think what attracted them to me in the first place became a problem for them because I am so strong-willed. And so independent. I never thought I'd get married. I never thought any guy would ever possibly, because like I said, my past would always become a problem, even though it's never in the face. But I've wrote a book mm -hmm. and people know who I am. And, you know, you get other people asking or being polite and nice and, oh, well, what does he want? Do you know what I mean? It becomes a problem, mm -hmm. even though it's work or it's so... But then again, it's a turn on for a lot of men as well. Powerful women, strong, independent. Oh, listen, I've like, had them that just wanted yeah. notches and I'm like, oh, you, I'll keep you the married, but I'll keep you there. And I'm like, do you think I'm right. the second best? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll keep you in that apartment. I can, no, bye. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, that's it. don't insult me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd rather live in my council house, thank you. Mm -hmm. I've got a bit more, you know, now my fridge is full, I'm rich. That's how I see it. I like nice things. I've got to a point where I can have, I live in a beautiful house now I used to clean houses where I live in now mm -hmm. you know and, it, and it's but I'm grounded with it I'm never but I've noticed sorry okay. I've noticed there's a lot of envy mm -hmm. and I've got to be so careful because why is she driving that is she is she dealing because yeah. <laughs> straight away how could I possibly and for years I was so paranoid of having anything nice because mm -hmm. I thought they'd gonna, even I wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. I remember watching the film Blow, Johnny Depp. I think it was a true, mm -hmm. I think it's a true story. I think they were making like sixty million. I don't know if it was a year or a month for they had sixty million, but they end up with nothing. They ended up just with the cheap tracksuits so on, not a pot to piss in. Like when you're getting millions of pounds passing through your hands monthly, when you're d traveling about doing deals, to then cleaning houses in Blackpool, like, do you the even remember that life or does it sink in that it obviously wasn't meant to be because when I'd done bad things I gambled all my money never felt really enemy I felt as if I didn't fucking deserve it and now I work hard and I, and I appreciate but it you but you think it's a bit like monopoly money yeah it's fake it doesn't it's doesn't mental make sense. because it's yeah. like even though you see it it's like well, it's not mine mm -hmm. and it's not and you know no, yeah it's, I, I, I feel Anything that's come from that life, I don't really want it. It's like dirty money for me now. I don't want it. In saying that, though, people might think, oh, well, but but now you're earning money from... But it's not just about... It's my experience of... It's your life. It's my life. Yeah, and you've done the you know, time as and well. It's, it's like I've never even wanted to do that. I've been pushed in a way to have to do that by society. You know, society does want to know that. You know, they're, they're buying the books. They do want to know because they're intrigued about that life. Yeah, crime so, sales, doesn't matter what you are. The yeah, biggest hitters on Netflix yeah. is true crime. But and then I get, oh, is it really true? Is she telling the truth? And I'm like, for God's sake, who the hell goes out then? Harper Collins, you know, there's lawyers being through it. There's things in court. You can't make stuff like that up. 
Mm-hmm. They're not going to do a book. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not, you, you can't, unless you're self-published, you can just mm-hmm. write the shit you want. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying I don't know how that works. I'm presuming after you go through legal mm-hmm. stuff. But but it's, you know, it's, it, it's not just like that. And I'm thinking, God, Jesus Christ, I, 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 blasphemy there. <laughs> the, you know, it's like, how can you, you can't make stuff up. I know it does. Why would you want to do that when you've been through the shit that you have? Yeah. What's your biggest regret? My children, my mum. My mum, she died of cancer. Sorry she was that. really poorly. In, it's 10 years. This uh, Christmas just gone, it's 10 years. I didn't realise it was 10 years. I was in an interview for an Italian newspaper last year. And she said, oh, how long have you... Uh, she, I said, oh, my mum died in 2012. She went, oh, that's 10 years. I burst out crying. It's crazy how I'm grieving, you know, you sort of all right, and then slap in the face, 10 years, where's that gone? Um, it's my mum, the hurt and upset. I put her through and she had to look after my child when I was in prison, Lara, my daughter. My kids are good now. Touch wood, thankfully. They're out of, they don't, uh, Frank's a mechanical engineer. Sorry, I've just gone from one thing to another, but Lara's in care, uh, as in, She's a carer. <laughs> she has got a degree in um, traveling tourism management, but she's more of a caring person. And she's mm-hmm. she's got my grandson, single parent, so she's only limited things she can do in a way. But um, so they're good kids. Mm-hmm. And my son's come out, even though he's from, uh, you know, from a side with both parents. You know, people say it's in the DNA. <laughs> Did you worry for that? Do you worry for that? Yeah, me and my son. There was a time where he was going down the wrong path and I had to pull him in massively. And the people that were involved with him tried to tell me, well, if we went somewhere else, we couldn't look after him. I said, I don't give a shit. <laughs> you're not doing that. I don't care where he goes and I will do something about it because you're not touching my, my child. Not after. And I, I was like, well, the repercussions is they're going to think that I'm involved in it. They're going to think I'm the one that's the boss of it because <laughs> they won't, you, do you know what I mean? And the only reason they don't is because I lead a normal, a, a, a clean life. Mm-hmm. So um, there's all that to think about and all the repercussions of everybody else in the family. And, and thankfully, uh, my husband actually saved him, I always feel, because he gave him a job. Mechanical engineering, that's what he's doing now. I could on him. See, when your dad got out, were you worried that you get sucked back in again? No. What, well, my dad? Yeah. yeah. When he came out of prison, did you ever think, mm, did you? I was shocked that he didn't. Were you relieved? Yeah. If he did, do you think you'd have been back because of your loyalty? No. No. No way. I'm not going inside again. There's absolutely no way am I going back in there. And when did you Because I, 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 can't, I couldn't, it was my loyalty and it was, you know, it's, it's nothing. I love my dad, but no, you've already had that, had that from me. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen again. Tell me this, even though I know it's a mad life, <coughs> do, you, do you miss it? Uh, I miss my family. I miss how it used to be. I miss 20 of us at the table. My nonna cooking from six in the morning with an apron and then organising the shipment. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's, it's crazy, you know, and she, yet she, she was so ruthless, yet she'd give you a last penny and have another 20 people eat. You know, at the table, it, it's crazy and people don't understand that side of it. Mm-hmm. But um, that's what I, I miss my family. I miss the way we used to be. I miss, it was never about material stuff. Mm-hmm. How many levels in the mafia is there? Especially your family. So you've got, you got the the soldiers, lieutenants, you know, generals, and then you've got the the chief, haven't you? Is that the dawn? So the, yeah, that was my father. And my nonna, in a way. She sounds like a proper badass, doesn't she, uh, man? She was, she, but as I said, she was so soft as yeah, well. And man. giving. Mm-hmm. You know, she'd scratch my head and look for nits. 
at 22. <laughs> you know, it's like just, this habit. This is really crazy. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? It's like I, just, I didn't have Nate, but it was a, a thing of like when you were younger, she'd be like mm -hmm. <laughs> looking for them. I mean, I did have him when in the 70s and you had to shave your head then. You didn't have all these powders and lotions and, you know, but she still at that age, she'd scratch my head and then start looking on. What are you looking at, Nonna? Have you got any nails? <laughs> it's like, no. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's just silly. It's crazy, you know, to think. And people don't see that side. And of course, there's that ruthless side. And then, but you're talking about people that have grown up into that. They're born into that. She didn't know any anything. I knew different. I knew right from wrong, and I still made my decisions. And like I said, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not a victim in this. I'm not. I did do wrong. I put my hands up. I've done time. But how much more am I supposed to pay for it? Yeah, there's only some. You can't keep living in the past. What makes a good soldier in the mafia? Loyalty again. Being on time, you know, uh, discipline. Loyalty, knowing you can trust that person. If you if you're in a situation where you know we used to go go around with armored cars and weapons in your cars because you didn't trust anyone, even though you were quite strong and people were feared you, there'd always be that crazy person that would come along and think, ah, oh, I might be able to do. It. And there was. Um, and in fact, they put he put about hundred thousand lira which was about £80,000 on my dad's head. And my dad was so, he said, I'll give him double just to walk away. <laughs> he said, I was so insulted, that's all I'm worth. And he was just some miserable guy that wasn't even, he was affiliated to another family, which was a, against my family down southern Italy, but he was a nobody. But that's where you get that, who'd want to come up the ranks and you think they're so, but they're not, mm -hmm. they're not. And I guess... You know, businessmen that want to become gang criminals or like, it's not going to work. It has to be the other way around. The criminal that, try, that becomes the businessman mm -hmm. because the businessman has never got it in him to be ruthless like someone that's been born into that life. Yeah. What's the worst thing you've seen while involved in the mafia? The last thing. The worst thing. The worst. Uh. I guess one of them was knowing that guy was going to die. Um, Why do you think that's the one thing that stays in your mind? Were you close to this man or did you know? Because I knew him and I knew the family mm. and he had children. So I felt really bad. I did feel really, really bad. And I still do, you know, to this day that they didn't grow up with a, with a dad. But then he made his choices, didn't he? He was, he was old enough to know who he was going up against and what he was doing, the risks he was taking. So that wasn't on me, was it, to, I guess, to carry it on my shoulder. Uh, it's just hard when you know someone's going to die. <laughs> you can't stop it. Um, but see, when you think of that, their family growing without a dad, and then while you're pregnant with your son, and then... His dad gets killed. Did you see the resemblance? Did that play a massive effect on your mind? Yeah. I used to have a reoccurring dream. It's crazy, this. For years, of running with my dad. Police chasing us, running for an airport. They shoot my dad, he's on the ground, and I'm grabbing him, crying. It was the same. To every small detail, it was the same. I didn't have it all the time, but it, it was over years. And then that happened with Frank and he got shot. I always thought my dad was going to get shot and die. It's obviously a subconscious thing of the life he was living. And then that happened with him and it completely it destroyed me. Mm -hmm. I'd only been out the year before from prison. That kept going. I was surviving, surviving, surviving. And my son, obviously, and my daughter, of course, but I was pregnant with him, so I had to keep going. I don't know what I would have done if I wasn't pregnant, to be honest. So it's when you came out at all and then you start working on yourself. You're talking about being a criminologist and digging deep and kind of working within that. Was there a lot of tears? A yeah. lot of regret, a lot of pain? I had just buckets of tears. A release I can't cry anymore. Oh, cry I out. can't cry anymore. Is that a good thing I, or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. I want to be able to cry. <laughs> I can't. It, it, I just, I'm, 
and it makes it look like I'm really hard. I'm not. But when I do cry, I, just, I can't stop. I could cry a whole day. Um, but I just, I can't, I can't, I, I can't, I wish I could. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should go and see someone or I don't know, but um, I'm keeping it together. You know, I'm quite level-headed. I'm doing what I'm doing. I know what I want and what I don't want. So, uh, yeah, but there have been buckets of tears. And, of course, the ultimate was when Frank died. How's your relationship with your dad now? It's good. It's the best it's ever been. I love him. I can't, I can't not, you know, I'm not going to, I know the background. I know what he's been through. I know what he's done and what he hasn't done. And he's not a, he's not a bad person either. He's done bad things. But, you know, people say, say, uh, oh, well, you're not that person anymore. But we are. We're still the same people. We just change our ways and we change what we do when we change but we're still the same people. You can't just change your personality. We grow into ourselves, don't we, and you get mature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people change. I've spoke to some of the baddest men, some of the some killers, some drug lords, and they love with regret, they love with pain, but they can't change it. People say, oh, the lives you've destroyed. Listen, they can't change it, but what they do now is speak in schools, go to prisons, tell people, no, listen, that's a fake life. Nobody ever gets out, ever. Everybody, I've done over 300 interviews and what I've realised nobody's ever gets out mm. I don't know one person who's at the top of their game and then disappeared and, and enjoyed the rest of their life mm. because there's something in the back of their subconscious mind I believe that keeps them there until they, they face the, the repercussions of what they've done in life like karma I don't know if it's real or not but I know when I've done bad things my life was a disaster I'm doing good things now I still have moments it still always cracks up here yeah. because I'm in a good place I'm not doing bad things I handled them better yes that's it's just weird that the way life is. I don't know why we're here. Nobody really knows what the fuck is going on. Like, we genuinely don't. We, was, like, I've been in so many different lives. I've been so many different characters. Yeah. I think we're just all acting it. We yeah. find a character that we actually like and mm. then we just stick with that one. I know I'm not harming anybody anymore. I know I'm not harming yeah. myself, especially with mm. drug abuse. But what I do know is what I'm doing is a positive. What I do know, I know I'm making mm. legit money. I mean, money's not everything. It's a, it's an illusion. No. Do you know what I mean? You've had that. You've no. lost that. And yeah. you realise it's all fake as fuck. I've had some men on here that are making a million a month. Yeah. Not got a pot to piss in. Yeah. And they're happiest they've ever been. So I don't That's have all right. the answers to it. But what I do know is just try and stay in your lane to be a better person that you were yesterday. It's difficult because there's so much competition. There's so much social media. There's so much trying to compete with mm. the Joneses. But when it all boils down to it, just fucking try and be as happy as you can be. Whether you've got fucking zero money or whether you've got a million pounds, because I've met people as billionaires and unmeasurable bastards. Yeah. Spoke to a man who was 25 years in the street and he was telling me more jokes than anybody I'd ever met in my life. So life's just the way you see it. Mm -hmm. Go through your whole life. Like, what do you think speaking about it? Like, does it bring back a lot of emotion? Because obviously these yeah. interviews run a wee bit longer than most. Yeah, so. no, I, every time when, when I do talks, it's quite draining for me as well. But, but it's like a therapy as well. For myself as well. Because I've had to suppress it mm -hmm. for the 10 years after. Suppress so much. Mm -hmm. And now I'm able to, actually, I can get this out. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, it, it is like a therapy in a way. And if it helps someone else, that's my, even if it's one person. Mm -hmm. You know, I go to prison, I went to Lancaster prison. I've been to Pentleville, the guy's mm -hmm. prison. I mean, I like to go into women's prisons and... And they're sort of like, well, hang on a minute, she's able to do that. Let's see, I might do a criminology degree. I might do, you know, it's it, it, it's just giving them that little bit of hope. Mm -hmm. And why not? Especially when you're in there because you just think, oh, just, my life is over. Yeah. How do you learn from the past to then give yourself a better future? The experience of it, isn't it? Mm-hmm don't repeat certain things and try and just just enjoy life, the simple life. You know, you go for a walk on the front in Blackpool, it's, you know, it's cold, but it's beautiful. Listen, you're it's, in Glasgow today, for yeah, it's no. that summertime <laughs> down there. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. it's pretty cold up here. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, it's just the just, just simple, the kids laughing, my grandkids having them, I love my grandkids, I'm so family. We normally have them every weekend because uh, Jim's got his children... My, sort of my grandkids' age, so he started later in life. So <clears throat> we have them all there. One time with my two older ones, like six of them, <laughs> we're like, whoa. But we wouldn't have it any other way. 
Um, Does that feel like a bit old time when you're cooking with your nana and yeah. you get a table for that? Oh, I mean, I'm cooking for my grandchildren. Oh, yeah. my meatballs and nana, nanny, they call me. Mm. Oh, get your meatballs. Oh, yeah, and they all start, yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm like, mm, it's nice, even though I've stood there three hours doing them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it feels good. I like that. Yeah, and I want them to feel that, that family feeling, and they can come to me. I always say, you can come to nanny. Anything, I'll never judge you. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll always, one's ten, one's four. I think the four one's so clever. She's so, um, mm -hmm. so on, on it. <laughs> and, uh, do, do, you know, and, I, and I'm proud of them and I just think, if my, like my, my children, whatever they're doing, I'm proud of them. It's hard, it's hard for my son being told, you know, your mum's that, your dad's that. It's like he, at one point, had to show, well, what am I? Like he had a, an issue with his person of... Having to show his testosterone, I guess, isn't it as well? Mm -hmm. Having to show, and it's like you don't have to show anything to anyone. Uh, he's a good kid, you know. He's a, he's, but he's a bit of a scrapper, you know. He's, he's tattoos and good-looking lad, six foot two, and uh, but easily could have, you know, and it's had a lot of, you know, people have said mostly it's positive stuff. Oh, you're Maurice. So on, aren't you? So everybody goes, like they go drink. You know. You're Marisa's daughter, you're Marisa's son. You know, obviously, I've wrote that in the, the, the series. So, um, but before that, I didn't even know, I, I didn't want anyone to know who I was. I didn't want none of that. Were you embarrassed? I just wanted to be left alone. Yeah, and ashamed, not embarrassed. I was ashamed of like, keep my head down, the judgment. done wrong. Yeah. But then I'm, you know, when I do my talks now. That's okay. When I do my talks, a lot of the students have said, you're owning it now. I thought, yeah, actually, I'm owning it now. It's on my terms. It's like if I do interviews, newspaper, we control it now with Amanda. Yeah. You know, they can't just write what they want. They can't, like they used to, that's what they did. So that's a, that's good that I can, and I am, I guess, owning it more now. Where can people buy your book? Um, Amazon. Waterstones, probably Amazon's the best. So that's going to be getting turned on to a film? Yeah, it's series came out this year. Yeah, it came last out year. Last year in April. Yeah. But would you a possible film as well? She usually do series these films. In the future, possibly. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm sort of tied in some contract with I have been asked with uh, Amazon Prime. So uh uh it's it's a bit of a yeah, but in the yeah. future Listen, you know, hopefully man, you've lived that life. May as well make money from it, legit like I know people can be embarrassed or ashamed to think, but it comes a time you, like you say, you're more open to be talking about it now, yeah. and that shows that you are healing. I'm ready. Yeah, and yeah. that's the main thing because you're always going to think about the pain of the past. People say, "Oh, stop living in the past." I preach the power of now, which is all about living in the present moment. Mm. But if I'm happy, my negative thoughts will kick in and tell me that I shouldn't be happy. And sometimes it can ruin my day. It can for a day, two days, and then I go, "Wait a minute, I'm doing that thing again." These days for me used to run months months and then it was drinking and it was drugs and then I didn't want to do anything so I'm in a great place still but I still struggle I still fucking feel yeah. I just can't be asked that like, what have you learnt the most out of that life? Um, to try and be a better person really I think as in learning to accept myself not to please everybody else this is, I feel like and not to try and save tormented souls because mm -hmm. I feel like I've had relationships after my father I suppose probably slightly sort of like my father like you were saying before there's an element there of Frank being like of the I've always been a magnet for being. criminals <laughs> mm -hmm. I've, not that I've gone out looking for them they've looked for me they actually found me all the time and I've gone oh well you know um so, yeah, I, I'm. I, I. It's just learning to sit right in my own skin, and to not be ashamed anymore of, of of my past. Because ultimately, I'm also a good. I'm a good person as well. You know, I try and do good deeds, and I'm not that. I don't. I don't go out my way to tell anyone or show them. You know, like these people, they'll go and give the homeless person some food and then record it. I've done that. I'm not recording it. It's for me. It's not. I don't need to to show. You know. It's it's not. It's. But I just want to be good for my family and and just live the rest of my life. 
with no hassles and no, you know, n- not looking behind my shoulder. Yeah. That's good. Fair play. Like, for anybody that's watching that's maybe stuck in a life of crime or out of life of crime but trying to move forward, like, what advice would you have for them? Get out of that environment. Get away from the people around you if you can and get out of that environment. That is the first place to start. You cannot try and change if the environment around you is still the same. Mm-hmm. Would you like to finish up on anything? Well, thank you for having me. It's You're been good. Mm-hmm. And um, just, you know, please don't commit crime. Ah. <laughs> it's not worth it. Marissa, listen, for thank coming you. on and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. You've definitely lived life. I can see you that you're a proper person. I wish you nothing but fucking success and whatever dreams you go for in the future, I hope you achieve every one of them. God bless you. Thank Take you, care. James. Thank, thank you. you.